My name is Ben Caro. I'm a, an avid cyclist here in Portland. I'm also a system administrator. I work with computers all day, but that's completely tangential to this talk. This talk has nothing to do with like software and laptops and coding and things like that, although there is, there is open source hardware in it and some open source firmware to go with it. So if you want to consider that software, then it's definitely all there. Um, but my credentials for this talk are, I like building electric vehicles. Um, I've done some conversions of large vehicles, uh, like some, I had an old MR2, and I've also built things up uh, like barstool racing, like I uh, mentioned previously, and uh, just standard electric uh, bikes. Um, so more bicycles instead of uh, motorcycles, but there's no reason why I couldn't do any of those. Um, so this is kind of my route. This is, the, this is what I take around Portland. Um, so I live in Northeast, I head downtown, I go all over the Southeast, and oftentimes uh, I like to do it. It's a nice sunny day, unlike today. Maybe it'll get a little bit sunnier out. But uh, yeah, when, when that's happening, I just you know, ride my road bike, and that's perfectly fine. I'm physically fit, I feel great. It's a wonderful day, I'm having a great time outside. And sometimes in the dead of winter, it's kind of miserable. It's raining outside, my muscles are sore, my joints are aching and stiff, I don't really want to move, which is why I built this thing. Um, and this is kind of it half completed. Uh, as you can see, I have an elaborate system of bungee cords strapping everything to the bike. Uh, I don't recommend this method. It's terribly bad, but if you're prototyping, it does work. Um, Duct tape does work. I just wanted something to leave less sticky stuff on my bike afterwards. Um, what is an electric vehicle? If we ask Wikipedia, it gives us this kind of uh, really generic answer. Uh, is, but it basically boils down to anything with an electric motor on it. And you can power these through several methods. Um, but first, where can we find these? Yeah, thank you. Um, you can find these in places like China. Um, every day, there's about 120 million electric bikes on the road, which is equivalent to about half the number of cars that are in the U.S. that travel every day. So there's a huge market there, and they're growing at tens of, they're selling them at tens of millions per year. So it's definitely an increasing trend. Um, China has the most electric bikes out of any place on the road, but it's very popular uh, throughout most of Asia. Um, additionally, uh, Europe ha is uh, a, an increasing market as well. Um, Places like uh, the Netherlands or, uh, or Denmark that historically have had lots and lots of bike commuters have been, uh, as they've been kind of pushed out of the urban center and more people are trying to commute in, uh, they want a little bit longer range. Some of them don't want to bike as much. Some of them are getting a little older and they don't feel like they can bike uh, regularly. Uh, electric bikes are a huge thing for them. So yeah, if you've ever been to uh, uh, Copenhagen or uh, Amsterdam, this is exactly what it looks like. There's a huge number of bikes everywhere. Um, so what do electric vehicles overall look like? Um, some people just think of it like that. It's an awesome little scooter with a little kid having a ton of fun. Um, this is kind of what you'd think of if you went down to an electronic or an e-bike shop. You'd get something that looks like this. It more or less looks like a bicycle with a big battery pack on the back. Um, we're lucky here in uh, Oregon, there's a company called Bramo down in Salem, and they make this, which is really cool. It's a, an electric, mi uh, electric motorcycle, 100 mile range, pretty fancy, that sort of thing. Um, of course, people do stuff like this with shopping carts. Um, it's a whole lot of fun, but you wouldn't, I wouldn't really want to commute on that. Going over the Broadway Bridge on that just seems like a bad time. Yeah, I need some bigger wheels. That's the only thing wrong with this. Um, there's also golf carts. Uh, a lot of people either they're stock uh, elect uh, electric to begin with or they convert old gas ones into, into electric vehicles as well. Um, there's a company called Gem that sells things that look like this. You've probably seen one rolling around a college campus before. Uh, they're popular with like janitorial staff and uh, just other kind of college faculty. Um, and then of course there's uh, licensed commercial cars. Um, and huge things like this, gigantic trains, which are absurdly complicated, and I can't even begin to describe the systems that power these things. Uh, uh, so basically, what makes these things run? This is kind of what I wanted to explain to you guys and explain how uh, electric systems work, 
um, all the components of them, and by the end of this talk, you'll probably know way more than you ever wanted to know about these things. Um, so first, we're going to start with these. I'm sure you've seen one of these before. It's a stupid AA battery, um, which is a battery, but if you tried to power an electric vehicle, you wouldn't really go anywhere since these have a bunch of horrific properties for that application. You can obviously use them in a television remote or something. Um, so you can power them with uh, batteries. You can also have external power, like trains work. Um, Volvo right now is experimenting with uh, uh, using the same kind of third, live third rail in highways for semi-trucks, which is probably really cool. Um, I hope that that ever materializes in the real world. Um, but as it stands now, trains use this sort of thing. Um, and also there's hydrogen power, which uh, I know they've just installed a couple of hydrogen pumps in Portland, right? Did they? Holy crap, I was kidding. Are you serious? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you out. I just, I didn't think this ever went anywhere. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So eventually this can be really good because it's got uh, potential for really dense energy. You can carry a lot of energy around with you. But in terms of DIY stuff, I, I can't build something to create chemical reactions with your hydrogen to create energy. Um, maybe it's something I should be looking into. Uh, but we're basically going to be dealing with batteries. Uh, just because that's what you can salvage, that's what you can buy on the market, that's the most popular stuff. Um, that's what I have the experience with. Uh, so, how do these things work? Um, so this is just kind of the schema uh, for any electric vehicle from that, that little shopping cart that's electric all the way up to those trains. You've got batteries, you have positive and negative into this big thing in the middle here called the controller. And the controller basically uh, tells your motor how much uh, energy it should feed it depending on how fast you want to go. Uh, the thing above in the middle there is just a throttle, and there's three wires, a positive, a negative, and a middle wire to tell it, uh, like, the throttle position. So 10% down, all the way to the floor, or something like that. And so, yeah, the controller basically just tells the motor how fast to go, and it's responsible for a couple other fancy things, which I can get to in a bit. But everything from bicycles all the way down, or all the way up to trains, uh, just uses uh, this sort of architecture. Of course, trains have a ton of motors, a ton of controllers, and sometimes a ton of batteries. Uh, yeah. So batteries. Um, these are double A's. Can we run an EV off double A's? Yes, you can. No, you don't want to. Um, for one thing, they're way too small. For another, you need w if you, even if you got a bargain on several hundred of them, you can't recharge them, so you can only go once. And they can't uh, output energy as fast as you need them to. Um, which is one of the considerations of selecting vehicles for, uh, for if you want to build something like this. Otherwise, you can use something like car batteries. Uh, we refer to them as lead sleds, just because batteries are made of lead and they're huge and heavy, so they go down the hill like a sled. Um, when you look at uh, EV conversions in the past, this is what you're going to see a lot of, um, simply because uh, for a long time this was the only battery technology available to people. And they're cheap. They're super cheap um, compared to other batteries. And uh, they can dump out a ton of energy if you need them to. They can dump out more energy than you're ever going to use. Um, and so this is kind of the next generation, or rather, this was the next generation of battery technology back in the 90s. Um, they're nickel metal hydride batteries. Um, they use nickel for a source, which is still nice today. Um, it's still plentiful today, and we can get it in Canada, which is where Toyota has this plant. This pack is from a, a Toyota Prius, and uh, yeah, uh, all, of the, all of the generations of the Toyota Prius have used these nickel metal hydride batteries, um, primarily because nickel is a common metal in Canada, um, and as we can see in a little bit, that's kind of disadvantageous. It's disadvantageous, disadvantageous to use lithium batteries just because they're all sourced uh, directly from China and there's a bit of uh, price fixing going on with it. Um, overall, they're good. Um, they're m way more expensive than, uh, than lead-acid batteries. Uh, but, uh, yeah, two decades ago, this was the latest stuff. Um, 
Right. There was, yeah, they're, they're still pretty good nowadays. Um, some of the great parts is they're recyclable, so when the, uh, the nickel in it becomes corroded and is no longer useful, you can get about 90% recycle rate out of it, which is fantastic compared to uh, a lot of other metals. Um, I'm not sure about the leaf. Okay, um, I'm actually going to get to those in a minute. Those might be lithium batteries. Um, some other cool things about, yeah, if you guys have any questions, just yell at me, I guess. Um, other cool things about these are they have lots of discharge cycles. So you can run them down and uh, dr fill them back up again. So you can discharge and charge them again uh, maybe 1,000 or 2,000 times before they start to lose capacity. Unlike, uh, oh, let me go back. Unlike these guys, which only last about three or four hundred uh, cycles, the the leaf is cool. Modern car. Uh, yeah, with with these lead acid batteries, you can only discharge them and charge them about three hundred times before they're pretty much dead. You can get some more life out of them by not wholly discharging them down to zero percent every time, but in terms of uh, comparison to other batteries, they're the weakest of the bunch. Um, which brings me to new stuff. Uh, there are lithium ion batteries. There's a couple different types. There's two different types I'm going to be talking about here. These are lithium ion phosphates. And they're like the ones in uh, most laptops. They're cylindrical cells. So like you were referring to, they, they look kind of like a D cell, but they're actually about a AA battery shape. Um, so they're cylindrical. They're useful. Um, like I was mentioned earlier, uh, all of the lithium for this, or the majority of the world's lithium mines are in China. So they can do uh, a bit of price fixing when they're selling en masse to other countries. Um, overall, these have... Expensive. Huh? They're horribly expensive. They are horribly expensive, yeah. I just... About... What's that? So is it pollution or is it just lack of natural resources that the lithium comes up by? Um, as far as I understand, it's lack of natural resources. Um, there could be some. There are some in other countries, primarily South America. But as far as I know, the, most of the mining is done in China. Um, so yeah, some of the great properties about these are they're still recyclable. Um, they are a bit more expensive. And they don't have as good of discharge rates. So you have to stack them up in series in order to really dump a lot of power out of them. Um, one of the great parts is you can discharge them and charge them a lot, which is why they're used in laptops. I've, I've discharged this thing I don't know how many times and abused it so much. And it's about three and a half, four years old now, and the battery's still at 80% of what it came out of the factory as. So they have some really awesome uh, yeah, discharge properties. Um, each of these, I mean, they're cylindrical cells. Each of those is uh, 3.7 volts, so they're pretty small capacity batteries. So you need a battery management system when you have these things in serial, and that makes uh, charging difficult and something called balancing difficult. Um, when you have them, uh, when you have batteries stacked in parallel like this, if one of them is a bad battery, and let's say these are both 3.7 volts, but this is only 3.5, you uh, you'll see only see like 10.9 uh, instead of 11.1 volts across this. And it can be nightmarish to debug and find out where the problem in your pack is, because odds are you have four of those things in parallel. And so uh, battery companies have, or rather uh, companies like uh, Lenovo or electric vehicle companies have created things called balancers, which actually have wires in between all of these batteries. You can see them in this photo. Uh, and that can uh, discharge each individual cell, so, and it can measure the voltage across each cell, so we can tell if uh, one of them is bad or not. And laptop batteries do this automatically. If you use these in an electric vehicle, it's something you kind of have to pay attention to. Um, you, you basically have to balance it uh, once every maybe 50 cycles or once every couple months. Uh, but you need a, a piece of hardware to do this. And that means you need, it's usually included in a charger. It means you need a special charger, it costs a little bit more money. Um, last, yeah, it's used in things like this. 
Um, it's also used in things like this. These are the ones that power the Tesla Roadster, the Tesla S, and the Nissan Leaf. Um, the last part I want, the last ones I wanted to talk to you about were uh, lithium polymer batteries, and these are the re re really, really new hot stuff. Um, and the technology is really good. They have a, they're cheap. Um, they're basically the second, they're the second cheapest next to lead acid batteries, but they weigh nowhere near as much as lead acid batteries. Uh, and they have uh, higher discharge cycles, so you can get maybe 600 or 1,000 out of them instead of the 300 of lead acid. They're still much smaller than, uh, than lead acid batteries, and you still have to worry about uh, balancing these. So uh, let me see. It doesn't say, uh, right, it says four series here, which means uh, each, of the, each little pack in here is 3.7 volts, and there's just four stacked on top of each other. And then you buy it as a pack. And in this case, it's 15 volts. And you can see the little balancer plug here to plug into your charger to do all that for you. Um, so the balancer isn't built into the battery? They have uh, a little bit of, of electronics. But uh, no, mostly it's just a little circuit board that uh, has all the wires going into it. So you can then plug it into a balancer. Um, the, I, uh, I have a couple with me, so oh, I only brought two. So these are uh, a couple batteries from my electric bike. Um, these are some of the biggest you can get. They are, uh, each of these is uh, 26 volts at 5.8 amps, 5.8 amp hours. I'll just pass that around for you. Um, and I usually operate four of these in my electric bike to get me about, uh, about 25 or 30 miles. If I really need to go long distance, uh, instead of plugging them in serial, I can plug all four in parallel, and then I can go about 80 miles, which is pretty awesome. So it just depends on if I want to go fast or go far. Um, but yeah, these things are pretty light. They have some awesome energy density, and uh, they can discharge faster than anything you would ever need. 26. Uh, yeah. This? No, this was 70 bucks. So yeah, they're they're really cheap compared to uh, uh, yeah compared to cylindrical cells, the other lithium cells. Uh, they can also discharge yeah 25C, so that's 5.8 times 25 amps, which is huge. Uh, which is why these things uh, are used in things like quadcopters. Um, before this, we didn't really have the energy density to be able to fly these things. Um, we could have used. Uh, old, uh, yeah, these lithium ion cells, but they can't discharge enough energy fast enough to be able to power these. Um, unfortunately, these have a couple drawbacks, like uh, they start on fire. Um, so if, you, uh, if there's a defect in the battery or, uh, or there's a defect in your charging system, so you charge it over its capacity, then it can bulge like this. And uh, after it starts bulging like this, uh, it actually creates a chemical fire, which is really, really bad. And you can't put it out with water, um, which is why when they charge these things, whenever you buy batteries, they'll send you the special bag to charge it in. So if it does catch on fire, it'll <laughs> smolder itself. <laughs> you also can't take these on airplanes. I don't know if they've caught on to that yet, but you shouldn't be able to take them on airplanes. <laughs> um, you can take them on airplanes because that's what's powering your laptop right now. Well, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Uh, on your electric bike, how are you monitoring your uh, discharge rates? Because I know with the lipos, you can only go down to a certain point, otherwise you start to just monitor the lot. Right. On mine, I, I bought this accessory called a cycle analyst. And it's just a little screen, and it, you screw it onto your, uh, your handlebars, and it tells you how many amps you're drawing, how many amps you've already drawn, how many amp hours you've drawn out of the batteries, what the voltage is, how many miles you've gone. It's a really cool thing, and it'll tell you how many times you've discharged the batteries and when it's time to replace them. Um, and you're putting that on to getting the life cycle of the battery and keeping track of that? Yep, pretty much. Uh, there's just a button you can press to reset it when you charge the batteries. So that's what I've done. And uh, yeah, my controller even has a little uh, output for the cycle analyst, just because this one is made specifically for bikes. Um, that's enough puffy batteries. You might be asking yourself, Ben, where can I find these magical objects? Um, 
and with batteries, there's a couple uh, good places. Uh, these lithium polymer batteries that I'm passing around, I got them all on Hobby King, which is a, a site that now ships from the US for some things, but uh, ships from China, ships from Hong Kong, ships from Singapore, and they have kind of expensive shipping costs. So you don't really want to do a lot there, but that's where I got these batteries. Uh, they're 70 bucks, which is really cheap for the batteries. Um, it's also where I got the charger. Uh, you can also go on eBay. Um, there's a lot of different uh, vendors online that if you just want uh, the cylindrical uh, lithium iron phosphate cells, uh, you can get them a uh, bunch of places will make packs for them. So instead of just buying individual cells, you can buy it as a big unit and it comes with a charger and it comes with a balancer and it's nice and they're a bit expensive, which is why I originally went with the, these guys. But uh, these don't have as many discharge cycles as the cylindrical ones. So in terms of a long-term investment, it might be a better idea to go with one of those pre-made packs for you. Um, if you just want some lead-acid batteries, you can buy new ones at a store, but, uh, and that's a fine solution. But what I really recommend if you're going to go that route is go to recycling centers or go to auto stores and ask them to see the ones that people have returned in for a core deposit because of this device. It's called DePimp. Um, and the, the guy who made this was actually at Dorkbot last night. Um, and he, he, runs a he founded a digital homestead for him and his partner down in uh, New Mexico. And one of the things they wanted to do was recondition batteries and run a lot of things off batteries. So he made this uh, device, it, and it desulfates batteries and kind of recovers them past the point when people think they're dead. And oftentimes, he can like, recondition batteries um, so they'll be just as good as new. So if, if you are building something on the cheap and you need some batteries, you can go to a recycling center. You can go behind auto shops and just ask to see their batteries and bring this thing with you and test it out to see if a battery can recover from it. Um, this little device here, it's open source. Um, and if you just search for, search for that with batteries attached to it, um, be sure to attach batteries, yes. Otherwise, I can't guarantee safe search. Um, but it's cool, it's open source, you can build one yourself, um, otherwise they'll sell it to you as a kit. Um, it'll charge any kind of batteries, and this wire coming here is the mains, and it just has three capacitors, and is terribly, um, I'm not gonna say it's terribly good for the batteries, but we're talking about dead batteries anyways, so if it can recover them, abusing it a little bit, then awesome, they're recovered. Uh, not every battery can be recovered like this, but if you can scram some UPS or car batteries, then can do something on the cheap. Um, so that's enough about batteries. That's kind of the, the corpus of the three main components, and I'm going to talk about the others, but the batteries was most of my time. Um, batteries, there's basically two kinds. This is the first kind. It's called a brushed motor, um, basically because of the construction. And if we look in here, you can see the commutator, which spins, and there's brushes along the edges. And it's called a two-phase motor because there's just a positive and negative. And, uh, it uses, uh, what is it, electromagnets. It uh, electrolyzes electromagnets and pulls the shaft in the middle towards one, uh, one direction or the other. Um, pretty simple. And uh, the majority of electric motors you're going to find belong to this category. Um, they're about 75 to 85% efficient. Um, and it's difficult to get things like regenerative braking out of them. But they are simple, they are cheap, you can get huge ones, which is awesome. Uh, the other kind are called brushless DC motors, and they work a little bit differently. So instead of two electromagnets, one at each end, uh, this is kind of a complicated one because there's six, but uh, if you imagine that this uh, centerpiece is rotating, and you are uh, powering two of them, and it's over here, then it's going to get pulled in this direction. And you just keep alternating which electromagnet electromagnets you're powering, to control how fast it's going. One of the really cool things about this is it's really easy for the controller to get regenerative braking out of it because it just kind of uh, retards the timing for that. Um, let me see, uh, Ben, where can I find these magical objects? Uh, forklift salvaging. Electric forklifts are really great parts to get huge EV components, like if you're building a car or something. Um, Odds are you can find like a forklift on Craigslist or industrial recycling for maybe 800 bucks, and then you could take the motor and sell the rest of it and have 500 bucks left over. 
Um, this is a route that I went when converting uh, the MR2 that I converted. I was able to get an 8-inch motor, which is about 40 horsepower. Um, and I stuck that in the back of an MR2. It was really good. Uh, you can get them on hobbyist sites. So there are some EV sites that will sell you uh, new motors in a crate, some that would go in a forklift anyways. Um, I've considered washing machines. They have brushless DC motors in them, but I don't know if there's a problem with that. I know they're, someone told me they're meant to spin at one speed, and they might not like spinning at variable speeds, but I want to try it and find out. So if any of you have like a wrecked washing machine, then I will definitely come tear the motor of that for you. Um, otherwise, there's EV sites. Um, there's also places like Craigslist or eBay, um, that sort of thing. Um, and the last part about this that I wanted to talk about was, uh, was controllers. And this is the simplest controller possible. This is just called a relay, if you've ever encountered one in a car or just in general electronics. And the basic theory is you have a small current going through this wire. Well, sometimes you have a small current going through this wire. And when you do, there's a little electromagnet here. And you can imagine this is literally a piece of metal. So there's just a, a switch. And it pulls the, uh, the electric current here pulls the switch closed. So, uh, so you can have really big power going through that. And that's basically the simplest controller you can make. Um, it's one part. You can go down to a junkyard and pull it out of a car. You can buy a new one at the auto store for two bucks. Um, but you don't really have a whole lot of throttle control. It's either on or off. So if that's fine and that'll work for you, then whatever. I've actually uh, ridden a motorcycle that, uh, that had three throttle positions. And it was just three relays and three batteries. <laughs> uh, there are other simpler controllers, and they're actually quite simple. All of these are the, the wires on them, and even some of these are optional. Like, you don't need a regen switch if you don't have regen. Um, if you're using a brush motor, you don't have that third motor wire. So it's really just uh, three, five, seven wires going in and out of the thing. Um, and you can get controllers on eBay. Uh, this guy, which I use on my electric bike, uh, conveniently uh, came with all the plugs for the other end, so I didn't need to worry about uh, making sure that all of the thing, all of my equipment already had it on it. Um, this was about 35 bucks on one of the hobbyist sites. And uh, yeah, it uh, fits on the back of my, ba back of my bike. Uh, I actually carry everything in this nice little pack here. So when I'm done with my trip, I can just unplug the seven wires and carry my bag with me so no one steals anything. So this, this affects the way it works for a throttle control. It affects how much amperage is coming out of the battery to the motor? Um, some of them work a bit differently, but most of them have uh, transistors in them. And they basically uh, send it, uh, they, they chop the power by uh, splitting it evenly. So it's basically turn the power on for half a second and then off for a quarter of a second and then on for half a second again. Except it does this really fast. So it basically controls the voltage that's going into the motor. Pulse, pulse width. Pulse, yeah. Pulse width, thank you. That's the word. And the motor is far enough to deal with that even though it's pulsing the magnet in the right sequence. Right. Right. Um, I wish I had like a, a blow up. I wasn't sure I was going to get this technical in the talk, but it, uh, basically, yeah, there's like uh, for a three phase uh, controller, there are four sets of transistors, and uh, one is for each phase, and the fourth one controls uh, the pulse that that goes out on. Um, they're a little more complicated to build, and as such, they're a little more expensive, but I mean, the one for my bike, and I'm pushing four kilowatts through, it was 35 bucks. Um, there's some really great resources out there um, if you're into this sort of thing. Uh, one is EV Album to go check out. It's kind of a, if you guys ever heard of car domain back in the day, it's kind of like the car domain of electric vehicles. So people can just post profiles of the vehicles and pictures of them and all the components they have in it and that sort of thing. And there's another one called Endless Sphere, which is basically primarily for bicycles. And it's primarily for people who build their own bicycles. So they have, it's a forum. So they have posts about uh, group buys, if you want to get on something, or reviews of things that have come out, or techniques, or build threads for people to document how their bike build is going, things like that. Um, that was. Do you have a hackability mailing list for people who hack these computers? 
Really? Oh, cool. Is that here in Portland, or is that just everywhere? Everywhere. Okay. Nice. Do you have a mobility scooter you've hacked? Uh, this one is not hacked, but my other, ah. one of my other ones is hacked. Okay. Just the awesome. That's, yeah. I made a DIY scooter kit with design. Oh, okay. That would be really cool. Yeah, let me know. I'm interested in that. So, yeah. Uh, let me get back to this. I think I have only a couple more slides. Yeah, this is kind of a, this is a scary big controller um, called a Zilla, uh, made by a game night a guy named Otmar down in Corvallis. Um, it's kind of cute. His little trademark here is this little Zilla dinosaur on it, which is really cool. But these are the, the biggest, meanest electric controllers you can buy. This one is 4 million watts. Um, he uses it to drag race an old Porsche that he converted. Um, yeah. It's, a, it's got a whole bunch of outputs, like uh, external shunts. A shunt is a thing that you can measure the amount of uh, energy coming out of the battery with. Um, so you can do that to make sure you're not drawing too much energy and breaking something. Um, it's got fancy things like cruise control, lights, gauges, that sort of thing. Safety features, security features, <laughs> optional. Um, and one of the open source parts that I really like, uh, this is called the Open Revolt controller. And this is uh, an open source design. All of it was crowdsourced. It was done on a wiki. Um, they're great, they're really cheap, um, and they can scale up to 500 amps, so they're good for even a lightweight car. Um, my next step in my uh, electric bike is I'm going to try, I'm not sure if this is, you can do it on a bike, but it might be a bit of overkill, so I might have to get a, a motorcycle frame and do it that way. Um, just because 500 amps at like 128 watts, it's 500 times 128. It's a lot of watts. Yeah, and then divide that by 750, and that's how many horsepower. <laughs> so yeah, it's open source. They're inexpensive. Um, you can buy a kit, or uh, he'll send you one that's pre-soldered. Um, he even has the PCB designs on, so you can go print it yourself and buy a bunch of components and do it yourself. Um, th this, as far as I know, is the, uh, the furthest advanced uh, open source electric motor design out there. Um, I wish this had more of a community. Uh, as far as I know, it's a couple dozen people, and they're all contributing to uh, the wiki. But uh, I'd really like for this to catch on, and I'd really like to be able to buy uh, turnkey controllers for not too much money. Um, I'd like them to like scale the process up so some of the components are cheaper, that sort of thing. But as it stands, if you want an open source solution, this is the best it gets. Um, yeah, where can I find these? Um, hobbyist sites, you can get a relay from a junkyard, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, industrial supply stores will have this. Um, I'm not sure if we have industrial supply stores here in Portland. I'm familiar with some. Do you know where some are? Southeast. OK. Yeah, I'd be interested if anyone knows uh, where I can find them, because uh, I've been to some in the Bay Area, and they usually have uh, components like this for uh, not too much since they're refurbished. Um, so, whew. Okay. Me? Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah, so that was the kind of technical part of my talk, and I hope that you guys at least got a little bit overloaded by all that. Um, so these are just kind of some of the considerations that you should keep in mind when you're converting a car. One is to uh, pick a light body. If you use a heavy car, then know you're getting a heavy car, and you're going to need to compensate with that for that by adding a bunch of power to it. Um, so in my case, I used an old first-generation MR2. These things are they're still a steel frame, but they're tiny. They're fantastically light. Without an engine, it came below 1,500 pounds, which is, I think, the best you can about, about the best you can expect for a production car. Um, and one of the things you're going to have to do whenever you convert a vehicle like this is create a battery box. So uh, you're going to have a bunch of cavities left over when you tear an engine out of there. So you'll usually need to like weld together um, some kind of frame that you can keep all the batteries in, make sure they don't slosh around and so you can tie them all together. Uh, so there's usually a bit of fabrication involved in that. That's one of the things to remember is uh, 
you don't live in a vacuum, but you usually are blazing some new trails here, um, simply because not enough people have converted a single vehicle enough for there to be uh, kits out there to create this battery box that fits an MR2 perfectly. So you can't be afraid of fabrication when you're doing things like this. Um, uh, another really good thing to remember is uh, you can use the existing vehicle transmission. There's a bunch of companies out there that will make adapter plates to fit an electric motor to the transmission that exists in the vehicle. So using that, you can get either a higher top speed, some more torque. Um, those are basically some of the features of keeping the transmission. You do lose a bit of efficiency out of them just because it's a mechanical process and it's a little more drag on the system. Um, my last suggestion in, uh, for doing something like this is to build a bill of materials. Figure out which motor you're going to use when you figure out which controller you're going to use when you figure out the batteries you're going to use. If all of these things have different voltages, then they're not going to work well together and you're going to end up blowing something up. And in a case of an electric car, those components are pretty expensive. Um, it also helps to keep you on budget. Uh, just because some of these components can be, uh, yeah, like I said, a little expensive. So if, if you have a nice visualization of what it's going to cost and a timeline for it, then you can approach it with a little more confidence. A um, couple more considerations. It's different when you're building a bike. Is uh, Use a mountain bike. Road bikes kind of work, but the tires for them are so skinny that you never really get any traction. And if you're biking at any speeds greater than a regular bike, your tires aren't going to be able to break as well. So it's, it's useful to use a mountain bike simply because of the smaller tires mean uh, you'll have a lower top speed but uh, higher acceleration. Um, they also mean you can stop faster, which is great. Um, one of the hardest things that I've encountered when building an electric bike is figuring out where to mount batteries. Um, you can use a case like this um, and attach it. Uh, mine, um, mine, in my case, is attached just uh, on the rack behind my back wheel. That's a valid strategy, but uh, one of the inconveniences of this is that whenever I leave my bike, I can't really leave this here because someone can just unplug it and walk away with $300 worth of batteries. So uh, you, you have to consider that. Um, if you use something in frame like that in a metal box, then no one's really going to bother it if you make it look sturdy enough, um, which is really cool, and I would like to do that. I just need to have a good strategy for battery mounting. Um, you can get little project boxes. Uh, they're usually made of extruded, extruded aluminum, and you can either weld that to your bike, or you can figure out some mounting solution for it. Um, and there's some great, the, the, my next step was uh, do some range and voltage calculations. There's some great uh, calculators online where you can say, my bike weighs this much, I weigh this much, this is how much battery I have, this is the motor I'm using, and it'll tell you how far you can go, and you can tweak those values. Yeah? Um, I'm, I'm using a hub motor and I'm dumping four kilowatts through it. So it's totally fine. Uh, that's another consideration. When I first wanted to build an electric bike, I started with, uh, it was meant for a scooter, but it's just a big cylindrical motor that you think of when you think of an electric motor. And I couldn't figure out how to mount it. I, I would need to like ha make some L brackets and attach it to my back rack or something else. And I never really put forth the fabrication, fabrication effort to, uh, to get it to work. So a hub mounting is really easy to get it to work. It just replaces uh, a hub mounted motor. is just one that's mounted uh, sorry, right in the center here. And your wires run up along the fork, and then you can go bring it back here. But it's still got the rim of the wheel around. So you just replace mine, in my case, is a front wheel. Um, so I just replace my whole front wheel with it. And uh, I accelerate its front wheel drive, which is a concession I made. But uh, I. Uh, Find the parts on Craigslist, and beggars can't be choosers. Um, my last suggestion. Huh? And my batteries are rear mounted. But uh, yeah, my wheel is front mounted, so I have wires going all around the bike. Yeah? Um, so I was lucky enough to find uh, a hub motor and a controller on Craigslist for 140 bucks. Um, the previous owner thought that he destroyed something because some of the, the motors, the wires going into the motor were shorted. But uh, I sat down and through an evening I figured out that all I did was blew the throttle. So I happened to have another throttle that I bought on eBay for my previous electric bike and I just used that and it worked perfectly.
which is, uh, yeah, really handy. And another thing is the components are cheap, so don't be afraid to replace them if you do something bad. Um, like I said, the controller is 35 bucks. Five minutes, okay. Uh, controller is 35 bucks. Um, you can get lead acid batteries just to test with for not too much money. You can even scavenge them. Yeah. Okay. Um, but try not to, if you're going to hack on them, try not to take them all out of the system and use mobility devices because then the same way people can't hack on them. Yeah, I need... But, but, but if you like, want to hack and also secure and then give it to somebody, okay. that would be awesome. Cool. Sounds like a good project. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> Thank you for the awesome talk. I'm taking notes. Yeah, yeah. I'm just about done. So... Yeah, things you can expect to have fun with. Uh, there are no standard connectors for anything. So you get to buy extra connectors and crimp them and solder them and mount them yourself. So this is me putting the connectors on those batteries that I brought today. Um, it's, uh, it's about an evening's worth of work. Uh, expect to have your hands burned a couple times. Um, I was also charging them while I was there. I actually made the charger. Uh, charger's right here, but it's a DC to DC charger. So I had to go down to Free Geek and buy a power supply for 20 bucks. <laughs> cool. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, the, the final thing is uh, you have to get used to kind of uh, makeshifting situations. Like, I, my, my charger cable wasn't that long, so I needed to uh, find something to prop it up with. So, cardboard box. Um, this is a good example of my charger, though. I went down to Free Geek, bought a power supply for 20 bucks. I wired two of, this, uh, two of the wires in here so it was on all the time. And then I just have the 12 volt, a bunch of 12 volt lead soldered together and a bunch of ground soldered together. And that's uh, powering my charger here. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just cut the plug off and I jumpered those same two wires. Yeah, um, I actually don't do that mostly because I haven't bought a brake lever that has a switch in it. But uh, my controller does have two wires and all you need to do is uh, touch the wires together and then it, re it turns on the regen braking. Uh, there's a, a USB plug on here too so I can actually tell it uh, what amps I want to limit it at and how much regen I want. If you, if you put regen at 100%, you'll probably go over the handlebars when you press the button. So you need to turn it down to something like 20%. Um, yeah, last fun thing to deal with uh, is registration. After uh, converting a vehicle to electric, sometimes the, counties, or the, the, the laws will vary from county to county. So in this case, uh, the fuel type is just E, but uh, many, many different places have different forms and some don't even have a, a slot for fuel, for fuel type. And some don't know what con to consider it, so they just consider them motorcycles. So sometimes you have to have a motorcycle permit to ride them. Things like that. Oh, that's something I should mention for the bicycles. If it produces above 750 watts and it's technically, technically considered a motorcycle, and legally you have to register it. But I don't know anyone who does that or, or cares. But that's what it says in the Oregon law. Uh, any questions? I don't know. Does it, did motorcycles typically have to do that? Uh, I know cars I don't do. Know how that works. I was just wondering, since you're, if you convert. They don't do electric at all? But okay. Do they verify to make sure, like say you did a car and you convert it to EV? Yeah. Do they make sure it's no longer an emission producing? Maybe. California and Washington check all vehicles. They don't? So you can just show up with a piece of paper and say, I want to register this? Okay. Cool. Huh. Yeah. Okay then. Thanks, guys.